Uh, so tonight we're talking a little about artificial intelligence and how it's working with the financial markets. Uh, it's just a really, really, I guess, a cool thing is one way to take a look at it. Uh, scary for a lot of people and complete garbage for other people based on how you want to use it. So, But it does have some benefits, and I want to cover some of the things that AI can and cannot do in the stock market. Uh, I know that Kendall's already gone through a list of disclaimers, so I don't really have to go through and read too many of them. Um, but uh, everything we're doing really for tonight is for educational purposes only. <coughs> All right. Uh, so what is AI? It's kind of the first thing a lot of people say is, what is AI? I know it means artificial intelligence, but what really does that mean for most of us? Uh, a couple ways that we think of AI and some of the things that we're doing today. Uh, if you ever watch Netflix and you come by and you're watching something and it says people who watch this also watch this or also enjoy this, that's a form of artificial intelligence. Really, it's kind of a dumb artificial intelligence. There's not a lot to it uh, other than just say that hey, if I get a movie that comes in, this is an action thriller with these stars in it. Uh, and so it's got some links for just that movie. And if somebody gives that movie a thumbs up, well, this column over here would say this is also action thriller uh, and this is also includes some of these stars so if you liked one action thriller with a star it might give you another action thriller with a star type of thing so really it's just putting movies into a database uh, but we think of that as a way of machine learning where netflix will come by and say we recommend that you also do this it's not really thinking on its own it's just finding similarities within a database that's what it's doing uh, Google Translate, however, that's some type of a, a deep learning that you might hear about when someone says, what is AI? Uh, Google Translate. And so that's quite, uh, quite a big one right now. So way that AI works, and here's the three basic types, and I'll kind of come back up to this deep learning right through here. We have three general types of AI. The first one is called artificial narrow intelligence. That's the N. Uh, and that's often just referred to as dumb AI, which just means you set an algorithm, which means just code, just a form of a code for computer coding. Uh, and you'll say that if this, then this, if this, then this, and this, and if this also, then this, but not this, if this. So it's really just a series of code. And it's called dumb AI, but it's letting the computer do the work for you. So even though it's just an algorithm, it doesn't truly think for itself. And that's kind of what the Netflix is doing when it's saying, we recommend this for you. It's not really thinking, oh, we really know Mike Koval, uh, or we know Kendall, or we know anybody that's on here watching right now. Uh, and we really recommend this because I also know their hobbies are this, 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 and this. Now they might have some of that based off of how much data there is about you on the internet, but it's not really learning all by itself. It's just finding similarities within a database and connecting those similarities and saying, hey, you might like this as well. That's called dumb AI or narrow AI, ANI. So you're gonna hear that term all the time. So it is artificial intelligence because it's artificial, meaning it's not coming from us, it's coming from the computer code. Um, you understand there's AI programs to do your taxes. Is that true? There is, but I'm going to tell you, I, I wouldn't use it, uh, but there is. It's just too new. So the next type of artificial intelligence is called AGI. And this is the big one you're really hearing everything about right now. It's artificial general intelligence. Uh, this is where the machines actually learn. You go into uh, a machine uh, language model, uh, which is otherwise known as uh, deep learning. And so you go into this machine learning model. Chat GPT would be a form of that. Microsoft Copilot would be a form of that. Uh, and you say, show me all circles that are green and at least three inches round. Uh, so, and you type that into a chat box and it comes back up and it just starts returning circle after circle after circle. And you say, yes, but that's the wrong color green. I want the true color green. So then you would reprompt it and you go back into the chat box and say, thank you for the results, but I only want these, this color of green. And the circle has to be three inches, but no more than a maximum of three and a quarter. And so then the machine goes back and says, okay, next time you ask for green circles, I'm gonna only return ones that are the shade of green. And so it learns, it learns who you are, it learns how you think, it learns what you're after, and you can keep prompting it over and over and over till you get what you really want. And so this type of machine uh, is uh, machine learning, otherwise you'll hear deep learning or machine learning model, uh, is very, very labor intensive because every time it comes up with something, you have to go back and have somebody correct it and say, that's not what I want. I want more of this or less of this over and over and over and over, month after month, year after year, until it finally comes up with what you want. And then it gets better at understanding what you're after. This is able to, to uh, solve problems and it's called machine learning models, uh, MLM. 
uh, not multi-level marketing, but MLM or deep learning. And this is the one that most people think about when you hear AGI. This is what most of us think that uh, artificial intelligence is. And that is the cool one. That's what everybody's striving for right now. It's just that most of what you see currently today is dumb AI. It's just it's artificial intelligence, but it's just really just programming. And then we have the next one coming out, which is going to be called ASI. And that's artificial super intelligence. This would be the ones where you watch all the sci-fi shows and you see an Android that is self-aware, knows what it's doing, thinks for itself uh, without anybody ever telling it what to do type of stuff. And this is the stuff that people are thinking is going to get scary going forward in the future, where will there actually be artificial intelligence that says, oh, you know, what's best for our uh, ecology or what's best for the world is to make sure that we don't pollute and it might go back and say the human race is a bug or human race isn't good and it might wipe out human race because it doesn't think it's any good uh, type of thing. So this is one that people are really scared about what's happening in the future is artificial super intelligence. We're nowhere close to that right now, guys. So most of the stuff we're learning today is AGI and that's what all the really big cool stuff you're hearing about is coming from. So when you hear things like uh, Google Translate, where it's able to go back now, it's so much better than it was five, 10 years ago, where it'll actually understand kind of the intent of what you're trying to say. So if you're saying something to the effect of uh, they are not as friendly as we are, uh, it'll actually go and understand if it's they are or there, and it can actually transcribe which is the correct word that you want to do uh, just through machine learning and Google's deep learning over and over and over. So Google Translate would be something like that. It just after prompt, after prompt, after prompt, after use and after correction, it's finally getting to where it needs to go. And at some point, the machine starts training itself and giving back results. And we have less and less work to do with the machine trains itself. Uh, and then we have natural language processing, which are chatbots. That's the big stuff people are talking about today. And that's also part of AGI. So to kind of recap, most of everything you see today is narrow. A&I is narrow. All the really cool stuff you see coming out right now is AGI general. And uh, the stuff that we think is going to be the really cool stuff, of whether we see it in our generation or not, I don't know, is ASI. But that's what everybody's really looking for to where we have robots and androids that are just up doing all the stuff for themselves without us having to tell them what to do type of thing. Uh, and so that's kind of where we are. Three different types, ANI, AGI, and ASI. Almost everything you see in a financial market today is ANI, just for an FYI. So what is what is not? So in other words, what is AI and what is not AI? So any type of a stagnant algorithm, which is most financial websites, often called narrow band or basic AI or dumb AI, just ANI, it's not true AI and what we think AI is, but it's what most AI is on financial websites. And I'm going to show you some examples of that. Any company currently today that's just using the term AI in their advertising, but does not have any machine learning products, that means where the machine trains itself and it gets better and better and better. And then we look at the results and we confirm the results or we say, no, that's not results. And the machine takes our prompts and goes back and does better and then gives us three examples. And then we say yes or no. And then it goes back and does better. Any company that just uses the term AI in their advertising, but doesn't actually have any machine learning products, isn't really AI. They're just using it for because that's the catchword, the buzzword that people want to know about now. Uh, for instance, Google search. It's not AI. When people look at Google search, hey, is that AI? Is it learning? No, it's a very powerful algorithm, but it doesn't think for itself. It doesn't try to create. It doesn't give specific feedback. It just says or it doesn't give feedback that we want. It just says based on what you typed, these are the results from what you typed. Have you ever tried to type in something on a search, whether it's Google or DuckDuck? Go, go, or if it's uh, Microsoft Edge, whatever it might be, you're trying to search for something and it keeps giving you the wrong thing. It doesn't understand what you want. That's because it's not really true AI. It's just responding to whatever you type into it and say, based on what you type into it, we think this is probably the correct response type of stuff. So things like Google search uh, isn't AI. It's just a really powerful algorithm. Now you can call that dumb AI if you want, but it's not the true machine learning type of an algorithm that we're really after. So, what are some of the current uses of AI today? I mean, what are some of the really cool things that it's doing? Uh, drug discoveries. There's all kinds of drugs that are being discovered these days uh, just through AI. And the reason for that is because uh, we as humans, we have a bias. And so we think, oh, you know, the new thing for this is everybody's reading the, the genome of this DNA sequence or whatever it might be. And so this is the really new upcoming stuff. So that's where I'm going to focus my attention. But some of the AI stuff has come back and it's gone back to stuff that was printed back in, in the 40s and 50s that we've forgotten about just because it seems so outdated. And it's used that information with the new information uh, to create new drug discoveries. So AI is doing some pretty cool stuff. 
uh, customizable chat bots. And I'm, we're going to use a couple of chat bots today in this class. Uh, customer service, you know, just some of the things AI is doing where it can print up a face and the face can actually talk. So if you go back onto the website and say, hey, I forgot my password. How do I get log into a website? You can click on it and it'll actually have a little person pop up on your screen talking about with a, in the background, the website you're looking for, explain to you step by step how to go back and retrieve your uh password to log into the website and it shows you step by step with an actual person talking to you uh, in real time. So that was pretty cool. So some really cool customer service things, phone calls that are going out that seem like they're real uh, that aren't. Uh, how about just all the movies that are being created right now? So scripts, you know, they're, they're writing whole new scripts with just AI. Uh, and at some point in the near future, there won't be any uh, thing necessary for us as humans to do. You'll just have someone type in, Hey, let's go ahead and create a movie about this, 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 and this. Uh, and using these type of actors and then we want this for the background scenes type of thing and then AI will do all of it for it and that's just what's coming out. It's one of the big things that they had that big actor strike a little while ago was the use of AI replacing all the background actors because it's no longer necessary. Uh, robotics, all the cool things robotics are doing. So let me just show you a little bit uh, like uh, on a chat box how that would work. So let me change my screen here and let's go to Here, screen share, and I'm not sure which screen are we looking at right now. Looks good, yeah. I'm seeing questions for ChatGPT slide eight chat box. Yeah, that's what I want to do. Screen two, so okay. one, two. Let's go here, share. So I'm just trying to get to the screen that I actually want to be here. Okay. There you go. Chat GPT for two transparency issues. There you go. Yep, that's what I want to use right through here. So that's what you guys are seeing right now, correct? Looks good, yeah. Okay, good. So let's just talk about uh, uh, some of the cool things here to say. What are some of the uh, – so right now I'm on Chat GPT 4, uh, which comes from uh, OpenAI. And I'll talk about what the other chat bots are. But chat bot is just something you type into, like you're chatting with somebody, uh, and it gives you the responses you want. So what are – some of the, let's go, what are the three best things created from AI? And just see what it says. So there's some really cool stuff that AI is doing. Now let's see what AI itself asks. If we say, hey, what's some of the cool things that you've been doing? Uh, AI, chat GPT or AI has significantly impacted various fields, creating some cool stuff out here, technologies and enhanced human capabilities, automated machine learning, auto automated machine learning, which just means the machines teach it to themselves with your prompts, uh, advanced NLP, chatbots, virtual assistants, translation services like Google Translate, AI in healthcare with diagnostic tools, AI driven investing for imaging tools can analyze x-rays, MRIs and other images for signs of diseases such as cancer often with greater accuracy and speed than human radiologists can do. Robotic surgery, drug skills. So what do we say? What are two more? And you just ask, what are two more? Here are two additional ones, self-driving autonomous vehicles, how they're making those better. AI and finance. Ooh, let's listen to that one, see what it has to say. Huh. AI has transformed the financial industry by automating complex and labor intensive processes, hmm. providing new ways to access risk, manage investments and enhance, enhance customer service. Algorithmic trading, robotic processes, automation, defraud detection, customer relationship management. Hmm. Yes, this is chat GPT-4 that I'm using currently at this moment in time, right up through here. Uh, algorithmic trading. Analyzing large data sets at high speeds to execute trades based on established criteria, potentially increasing profits, reducing risks, fraud detection, customer service. Hmm, pretty cool. So some of the neat things it can do, that uh, doesn't mean anything to me. AI and finance, that doesn't mean anything to me so far, but it kind of gives me an idea of what AI is. It's just really creative, some of the things you can do. Uh, it doesn't have to be finance. I know we're talking about finance, but what if I just said, uh, Draw a 3D 
draw a 3D animated image. Whoops. Oh, that was a, got another window open there. Here we go. There we go. Draw a 3D animated image of a happy acorn. I mean, it's just, I know this is really strange, but I just, it's the, the uses that are available to us right now through AI are staggering. Uh, you want it to write a book. You want it to say, hey, I would like to do uh, some type of a training program. It'll actually create a PowerPoint for you to do some type of a training program. There's a happy acorn. Now, if I said right here, put an angry squirrel right next to it, it would. I mean, that's just, it's amazing what's capable today that we just couldn't have done before. So when we say some of the neat things that it's out here doing um, through AI, it's amazing kind of where things are going. So I like all that. So what are some of the chat bots that are currently going to be used or things that you might be interested in? You might want to write some of these down because when you're going to start in some type of investing, uh, there's certain ones that are better than, than others and they're used for items out, different items. So currently open AI is the most popular. So that's chat GPT four. Now there's chat GPT three and there's chat GPT four chat GPT three. It's three and a half. Uh, isn't quite as capable as four. Four is more the professional version, but chat GPT 3.5 is a free version. It's not as smart. It's not as intelligent. It has about uh, three billion, two and a half to three billion actual prompts in it, which just means that data that it's using, pulling from different area, where chat GPT 4 has over a trillion different data prompts inside of it, where it draws that information for. It's the most widely used. Uh, the professional version, which is chat GPT four, uh, is about $20 a month. And it's what we're going to be using today in all of our analysis for our stocks that we're going to take a look at. Google Gemini is their version. So it's Google's version of chat GPT four. It's called Gemini. It's free on Android phones, which is kind of cool because it's obviously a cool product. Uh, but they have a professional version as well. Uh, you have to pay for, but the free version does really well. And it's on your, uh, you can just go to it, to the website or put it on your phone if you'd like. Microsoft Copilot, uh, they have a free version and they have a professional version. The free version only allows you to uh, ask so many questions per day before it says you've maxed out. Now, you can get around that. There are some ways to actually get around that just by closing your browser, cleaning out all your cookies and cache, logging back onto your Microsoft browser, and you start all again with 20 more questions. Uh, this one here is a little bit more internet current which just means if you're trying to pull something from what happened today type of a thing microsoft copilot's a little more internet current than chat gpt4 which might be a few weeks to even a couple months old based off some of that information uh, who owns the results of the ai based on one's input and fine-tuning your output uh, the company that's using it owns that however if you're trying to fine-tune your own chat bot you own that information but it's still using what's out there on the internet to fine tune what you own. At that point, you would own that chatbot. But if you're just using a basic chatbot, like right now, I just typed in OpenAI, everything I just typed in and the results are owned by OpenAI. So if I try to create my own chatbot, which you can, and it's going to be a huge business model going forward, I think that's going to be one of the big ones, uh, is creating your own chatbots to be used and selling them or going to other companies and saying, here's how we're going to use this. Let me show you how to implement this chatbot. You own that at that point of time. So Gemini Free. Copilot uh, it does a really nice job between uh, illustrations. So if I would have asked for the same thing right over here, this this uh, happy acorn that I just that we just pulled up there, if I would have asked for that happy acorn on Copilot, it would give me four or five or six different examples versus just one. So it's a little bit more uh, visually pretty, I guess, if that's what you want to use, and a little bit more current on the internet. Uh, OpenAI has just a lot more data behind it. Now, Copilot does actually use chat gpt4 as its backbone think of it a little bit like uh, xfinity telephones use verizon backbone type of a thing uh, so they have a, a professional version here which is 20 dollars a month just like open ais uh, and then get unlimited use for all that as well so those are the three big ones out there right now uh, anthropic anthropics claude 3 which means just their version 3 does a really really great job of analyzing images and based off you upload an image the other ones will do it to an extent but this is specifically made for this you analyze images put the image in there upload the image onto the chat box uh, and it'll not only tell you what's in the image but what it means and maybe what are some of the information you might want off of the data that was actually in that image so if you pull up a bottle and it's just let's say it's a bottle of water in a forest, it'll go back and say, oh, you're actually looking for bottles of water in a forest. What forest might you be looking for? Here's some of the different forests 
that are from different regions uh, and some of the water that might be clean images or clean water to bottle from those forests. So it does a lot of am analyzing what's in the images. Uh, and then Jasper AI is more of a content creation. So if you're into some type of marketing, you might be using Jasper AI chat. But we're going to use uh, chat GPT-4 and maybe Microsoft Copilot in today's class. Uh, where can you learn more about prompts for AI? It's a good question, Tom. Uh, just ask. Uh, so if we kind of go back and just say, uh, just ask, you can go back and just type it into your search browser if that's what you're after, just type it in there. Or just go back and say, uh, where can I L E A R learn more about prompts for that box? And it'll come back and give you the information. How cool is that? If you're looking to learn more about creating effective prompts for chat box, look at that. Uh, so one of the cool things about this is let it do the work for you. <clears throat> and it understands. And one of the nice things about this machine learning, it understands kind of the intent of what you're asking. It, you didn't just do a Google search and just said, oh, this is what's going to come up. And that's all you're stuck with. This gives you a little bit more information kind of how about that. Uh, kind of some cool stuff. So if you're not sure, ask it or just go to the, one of the free versions and ask it as well. All right, uh, so these are some of the more common ones. And again, we're gonna be using chat GPT-4 in today's class. So a lot of people say, well, why do we care about all this AI stuff? I know it's really, it sounds cool, but why do I really care about it? Uh, and the real reason, it's gonna be our next great evolution of mankind, revolution in how we do things. It's just, it's the next big turning point for what we do. Uh, and all of it comes with some potential for really, really great wealth uh, or financial ruin. You know, when do you wanna get involved in something, at the very beginning of something, or once it's been out for years and years and years? So do I play catch up after it's already been out there and get nothing, or do I jump in earlier things are kind of just getting out there? And if we talk about the fact that we used to be hunter gatherers for 10,000 years, go back to early mankind, we were hunter gatherers. And what happened with that, we followed herds around the country or wherever nation we're from. Uh, and your, your little herd, your little group was very small. Uh, you only had enough to, to provide for the group of whatever you're able to kill. Uh, you didn't have that much civilization because you just kind of were all nobats who travel all over the place. About 20,000 years ago, we switched to farming which started a huge population increase because now we stayed in one area. We didn't have to move all the time uh, and it created new communities, cities and governments that so we changed because of farming from what our human kind used to be, you know, we kind of changed. And I know there's been, you know, the stone age and there's been wheels and there's been Renaissance, all that kind of stuff. We're talking about some really big ones here that, that I'm talking through here about 350 years ago, we moved to the industrial age. Now look at how we changed from small farming communities uh, to the industrial age with iron, steel, new energy like coal, steam, petroleum, railroads. <coughs> How did that change our, our country? Cars, factories, airplanes, the increasing application of science to industry. We really started to see big, huge population growth because everybody moved into the cities so we could make all this happen, so we could have all the, all the workers, all the employees. It was also about that time, the very beginning of the stock market here in America about 300 years ago. And so that started to change. And that's what we're trying to get to here is the financial market. So about 70 years ago, we came into the computer age. Now, think about it. six of the biggest companies in the United States, the world for that matter, six of the biggest companies on the S&P 500, which is 500 of North America's biggest companies, all came from the computer age about 70 years ago. So when do you want to get involved in Microsoft when it's $300, $400 a share? Or do you want to get involved when it first came out at $8 a share? What about Apple? $175 a share or when after split, after split, after split, or when it first came out. NVIDIA, Alphabet, Amazon, Meta. These are some of the biggest companies in America, uh, and they all came around just from the last 70 years from the computer age. When do we want to get involved? Because right now we're just starting the AI age right now. Microsoft expects to spend about $100 billion, or they expect to bring in about $100 billion in sales from AI in 2027. Apple expects about 33 billion in sales next year. Uh, and Nvidia expects $95 billion in sales from AI this year alone. It's happening right now. We don't wanna wait too long before we start getting into it. The top six companies that we just talked about here, all from the computer age, add up to about $13 trillion in market cap. The total S&P 500, the 500 biggest companies in North America are worth about 44 trillion. So in other words, almost 30% of the biggest 500 companies in North America are just from six computer age companies. That doesn't mean we're not talking about what about all those banking stocks that are out there? What about all those energy stocks that are out there? What about some of those huge medical stocks that are out there? 
nothing. 30% of the entire S&P 500 comes from just six companies and they're all computer age stocks. And right now, one of those, number three, is AI. It's just starting the boom and we want to get into it without waiting too long. So JP Morgan, anybody know who he is? JP Morgan, Chase CEO. He's the uh, chairman, he's the chairman uh, and CEO of Chase, JP Morgan Chase, the largest investment bank in the United States, fourth largest investment bank in the world. Top three are from China and they have Chinese, uh, uh, what am I thinking, state funds in the banks. So this is the largest non-state fund bank, JP Morgan Chase. So he believes that artificial intelligence innovations will have as big of an impact on society as the invention of electricity and the internet. Wow. We are completely convinced that consequences will be extraordinary and possibly as transformational as some of the major techno technological innovations in the past of the past several hundred years. He talked about this in his April 8th this month letter to uh, shareholders. Think of the printing press, steam engine, electricity, computing, the internet, among other things. And he thinks this is going to be as big or bigger than, than all of those. Now, J.P. Morgan Chase began using AI over a decade ago. The firm employs over 2,000 AI and machine learning experts and data scientists and uses the technology across a number of divisions, including marketing, fraud, and risk. Hmm. That's what caught my attention. The firm employs over 2,000 AI and machine learning experts and data scientists and uses the technology across a number of divisions, including marketing, fraud, and risk. What's missing? Largest investment bank in the country employs over 2,000 AI and machine learning experts for the past 10 years and data scientists and uses the technology across a number of divisions, marketing, fraud, and risk. Does anybody see what's missing here? What does that look like? Stocks, investing. It doesn't say at all. Largest investment bank or, or company in the United States doesn't use AI for their investing. Why is that? That's got to make you think about that, right? So when you see all these advertisements for people coming back and saying, uh, I was not the one with the big problems, but I was using headphones. So when you see all these people coming out and saying, use our AI chatbots to tell you when to buy, when to sell, when to buy, when to sell. Why? If the largest investment company, bank, in the U.S. doesn't use it for that, how are somebody else that just created their own going to use it? I don't know, but it makes me think a little bit about it. So how do I want to use AI? And the reason that's just because it's still new. It doesn't mean it's not going to get there because it is, it's, and it's moving fast. But this is this month, April 2024. New York City chatbot advises small businesses to break the law. An AI chatbot set up to help small firms quickly obtain advice on the legal obligations and regulations businesses have to adhere to in New York starts telling business owners to break the law. Uh, AI tool falsely suggested it is legal for an employer. This is AI bot set up by the state of New York, by the city of New York. Uh, falsely suggested it's illegal for an employer to fire a worker who complains about harassment, doesn't disclose pregnancy, or refuses to cut their dreadlocks. It also provided incorrect information about the city's waste and sewage regulations and suggested restaurants are still within their rights to serve food accessed by rats. That's why people aren't doing it. Yeah. So they'll tell us they've been using AI for investing for another decade from now. Probably. You never know what's going to happen with that. But if the largest investment banking uh, company uh, in the United States doesn't use it for investing, it should be telling me something. Microsoft Copilot engineer, March, just last month, just last month, engineer found that its AI tool likes to produce a variety of explicit imagery content generated, which includes pictures of kids drinking alcohol, rampant drug use. The engineer initially raised concerns internally back in December 23, according to recent reports. However, his concerns weren't taken seriously and the product was kept and the product was still kept on the market, forcing the engineer to go directly to the FTC. This is a Microsoft engineer to sound the alarm, along with the propensity to produce explicit imagery. Microsoft's co-pilot seems willing to flaunt, break its own copyright guidelines when producing imagery. Isn't that crazy? This is just as of last month. So Microsoft, even its own co-pilot, breaks its own rules that it's told not to ever do. It does it anyway. And I'm not saying one's better or worse. I'm just telling you that's where AI is today. I'm going to show you here in just a couple more slides how we're going to use it, though. Air Canada defeated was defeated in a court order after chatbot lies about its policies saying that somebody could actually get a refund for something. 
Air Canada ultimately unsuccessfully defense resolved around the idea that it was the chatbot, not the company that was in fact liable for the bad information and that they could not be held responsible for the tool's AI generated output. This is what's important. It's the first time a case of its kind to appear in a US court. In other words, the chatbot wasn't held liable. It was the company that was held liable. So if a chatbot is going to be used or some type of a form like that's going to be used for investing and it loses money, who's ultimately held liable for that at that point of time? AI or the company behind the AI or the company who produced that chatbot for the AI. And that's what the scary part is. And that's why you don't see AI giving you a whole bunch of stock picks about what to buy today and what's the best thing out there. Next financial crisis could come from AI, says the current SEC chair. The next financial crisis could come from AI. Wow. So the next big financial boom for all of us here in the U.S. could come from AI. Huh. SEC, that's the police, police department for the U.S. stock market. It's just new. It, all, it just comes down to who's doing the programming and managing those machine learning models. In other words, when you ask it to look for something and say, I want you to find me a stock, as an example, find me a stock that's currently in an uptrend that uh, is undervalued. And that goes back and it pulls up some stocks and somebody has to say, this isn't an uptrend because of this. This isn't undervalued because of this, but I do like what you put here. And then the machine goes back and does it again. It comes back. Somebody has to go back and, and look at every single example, every single time to make sure it's correct, to make sure you're on the right item. And that's why it takes so long to train some of these machine learning models. So really, do you want to trust your entire financial future to that? How about your pension fund? You know, who's managing? Who's the one that's creating and correcting those prompts that are going through there? Do you want to make sure that your pension fund's using that? I don't. Let's just ask AI. Is generative, is generative AI, let's just go back and ask. Uh, here, share, is generative generative, which just means machine learning, deep learning, is gener generative AI any good at? I'm doing this to show you that it has some limitations. I'm not saying we can't use it because we're going to use it today. I just want you to know, should you really trust it? So let's ask even AI, uh, AI if it's any good at picking stocks. Is generative AI any good at picking stocks? And let's see what comes up for us has made significant strides in many domains, including stock market analysis and investment decision-making. Let's wait for it to go so we can read it. I'm not gonna read all of it. We'll just quickly go through some of the stuff. Data processing capability. It's really good at quickly analyzing data much faster than we ever are. Pattern recognition, you know, oh, show me a, a stock that's in an uptrend. Show me a stock that's going through an ascending triangle, data patterns, which are used. Uh, automated routine tasks, right? Challenges, overfitting. AI models, especially those trained by historical data, are prone to overfitting. They might perform well on past data, but fail to predict future movements accurately because they too closely aligned with historical data and things change as we know as they go forward. Transparency issues, they don't tell you why it gave you what it gave you. Do you really want to trust it? No. Uh, how, how good is the data type of thing? So the conclusion, while generative AI can significantly aid in stock picking by uh, processing large databases, in other words, show me a really good quality stock uh, and identifying patterns, it is not infallible and should not be used in its isolation. Successful investment strategies will likely benefit from a hybrid approach that combines AI-driven insights with human expertise and critical analysis. In other words, We've got to be able to leverage the AI, but we still need to make our own choice. If you let AI tell you what it's going to go back and do and why it's going to do that, you're going to lose your money because you don't know why it's doing it. Who trained it? Who said that this was an example that was okay to go back and use? Who didn't fix something if it was wrong, right? I don't want to, I don't want to have AI do that for me. So there are things that it can do. and There are some other things that it can't do. Uh, and so I just need to go back and know what it is good at. Uh, let's go back and ask AI, can you give me an, 
Or it's, I think I'd like to buy a stock, but I want to own it. So it's like in real estate, when I buy a stock, I want to buy a good quality stock, but I want to be undervalued. So if it's a house, I'd like to buy a good house undervalued. So let's ask chat GPT-4, can you give me an undervalued stock? And hit enter. And let's see what comes up. So in other words, let it do the research. Let it go back and pull all the data from all the stocks in the in the current U.S. stock market and analyze all those and say, is there one that's a good stock that's undervalued? And let's see what it comes up with. If you're looking for an undervalued stock uh, that might that might be a good investment opportunity as of April 2024, Qualcomm appears to be a promising candidate. Okay, Qualcomm. So let's go back here then and switch. And I'm going to go to my website. And that's what we're looking at right now. And I'm going to type in the top stock ticker symbol QCOM, Qualcomm, because AI just told me that it was a good stock that I should go back and, and use or take a look at. So let's type up QCOM. And here's our stock. Well, actually, it's, it looks like it's had a really nice rally through here. It's gone all the way down here from about $100 a share up to about $175. It's just starting to roll over right now. Its current value, its current price is one hundred and sixty-eight dollars and fifty-eight cents. Hmm. Fair value is one hundred dollars. In other words, that's the price you want to pay for Qualcomm if you wanted to buy it undervalued. And right now, this is the Warren Buffett calculation: you'd like to buy the stock at or below this price. Huh? In other words, this is what Warren Buffett wrote about in his book Buffettology about what is an undervalued stock. And here's how much you should pay for it. So this is the algorithm Warren Buffett uses to say if a stock is undervalued. So you can buy that stock at around $100. That's a good deal. Well, I don't know. It's right now worth $175. It has a P.E. ratio of 24. Wow, that's that's kind of high. The P.E. ratio, which is just how much you're paying price based off the profits of the company, is higher than the top 500 companies in North America, which means it's not undervalued. So let's go back and say, why is why is Qualcomm undervalued? Let's see what it tells us. Qualcomm is considered undervalued for several reasons that involve the market dynamics and company specific factors. Huh. Tech sector pullback, cyclical nature of chip stocks, company specific factors. That's a good balance sheet, innovative market position, external factors, comparison of relative undervaluation when compared to its peers and the semiconductor industry. Is that true? Let's see. Here's Qualcomm. And here's all of its peers. Right in through here, all of its peers. Qualcomm has a PE of 24. The peers are at 23. I don't see it's that much better than all of its peers. Every time it's red, it means Qualcomm undervalued its peers. So I don't see it as an undervalued stock. Warren Buffett says it's fairly valued if it's 100, and right now it's 175. That's not called undervalued. That's called overvalued. So do I really want to trust what it has to say? I can look at it so I can use the information that's coming across here and say, I see the information. It just doesn't mean I'm going to go back and use it, though. So that's what I like. That's what I like about AI. It's got some good information and it can tell me some things. I can then go back and find out if I like that. But if I really wanted to find an undervalued stock, I would just click on my stock scanner and say, show me all undervalued stocks that are currently in the stock market today out of 10,000 plus stocks. And then from here, I'll go back and find out one. Delta. Here looks like a nice trend over here on Delta. Undervalued. Show me all good quality stocks trading below their fair value, which means undervalued. And if I click on Delta, I can see that it has a fair value of $94 a share, which means if you can buy Delta at or below that price, you got a good deal. It's undervalued. And currently Delta is right around $46 a share. That's called undervalued. So which of those do we use? Both of those are one's deep machine learning where, where we're using generative AI. It's producing something based off all the data that's out there. Or we can go back and we can still use some of the dumb AI, narrow AI, and say, show me all undervalued stocks in the stock market uh, through here. And so we come back and take a look at that and say, that's a good stock. It's got a PE of seven, which means it only takes seven years of its current value to get your money back versus Qualcomm, which said 24 years. If you invest in Qualcomm at its current growth rate, it'll take you 24 years to make your money back. Qualcomm or Delta only take you seven years to get your money back. Which do we like? Which one's undervalued? 
one that gets my money back further. So some cool stuff out there, but let's keep going. So AI does, does do some helpful things. There's some really cool stuff that AI does. You can go back and just ask it yourself, and they'll tell you what it's really good at. And you can say, give me a couple more. So here's how AI is currently being used in the stock market today. And we're going to go back and see how this works and do some of this. Number one is stock picking screens. In other words, show me how to find some really good stocks to invest in. Now, we've got some fantastic ones on our stock screener. Only show me uh, stocks that are undervalued. Show me all the stocks that are growing their dividends the fastest. Uh, show me stocks that have stellar fundamentals, which means are quality the best of the best fundamental stocks. But we can also just go over here to AI and say, uh, what are the best website for stock? And so this would be a place where you would start your research at. So if you're going to use AI today for investing, the first thing you have to do is you got to find a good quality stock. So how do you do that? You got to use a screen, some type of, you don't just go back and say, uh, I'm thinking about Coca-Cola. I'm thinking about uh, DR Horton Homes. I'm thinking about Tesla. You don't do that. You want to go back and say, give me all 10,000 plus stocks in the US databases uh, and screen all those for specific things, whatever they might be. Uh, and you can then go back and just say, how do I want those? What am I really after? Right. So different companies do some screens. Obviously, I think ours is the best, uh, which is uh, Income Trader. But there's some other ones out there you can use for whatever it is you might be interested in any given time. So first thing you do is find a website to screen with. I've obviously been using mine today. That works out really well. Next thing you want to do is maybe say, how about some automated portfolios? Uh, just say, from that, say, okay, I found eight stocks I like. Then go back and research all eight stocks from those stock screens that they gave you and say, which of these stocks here are the best? And just type in all eight ticker symbols into your chat GPT or Copilot or uh, Gemini or whatever chat bot you might be using. Say, what are the best stocks? And from there, go back and just take a look at each of those charts. Say, here's the three best, which charts in an uptrend. Uh, you can also say, create an automated portfolio. Uh, create a... P-O-R-T-F, folio um, for a 55-year-old with $100,000. So just put your information here. Create a portfolio for a 55-year-old. Create a, let's do balanced. Create a balanced portfolio for a 55-year-old with $100,000. So just type in your age and your amount that you want to work with and ask your chat bot to give you the information. So, okay, it'll take the information and say based off of uh, the current accepted principles for portfolio balancing, chat GPT balanced investment portfolio 55-year-old with $100,000 to invest, considering several factors including risk tolerance, investment horizon, financial goals uh, at this age, Income and stability for retirement approaches. Here's how you might break this down. So the first thing it says, you might be putting about $50,000 into equity, which are just stocks. And so $20,000 into big cap, $10,000 into mid cap stocks, $20,000 into international government bonds, bonds, high yield bonds, real estate, money market funds. So it's telling you based off of that. Now with that strategic considerations with all that, uh, can you give me stocks for the above? Can I? Can you give me stocks for the above portfolio? Okay, so if I'm supposed to be spending X amount of dollars, fifty thousand dollars in equity, which would be about twenty thousand in large cap stocks, well, what are some of the stocks I should look at? It tells me some examples here that I can take a look at, and some examples here if I want to take a look at that. But I can ask more specifically. Bond right here, ticker symbol GOPT, uh, ticker symbols right in through here. So it's telling you what ticker symbol should I look at if that's what I was after. So if it tells me right now I should be looking at these items here. So if I want to say, can you give me stocks or ETFs for the above portfolio? I don't want any mutual funds is what I'm saying. So now I can go back and say, if I'm a 55 year old, I'm 61. Uh, but if I'm a 55 year old with $100,000, it's telling me that um, I probably want VOO, $20,000 of VOO. It's telling me right off the bat, that's what I want, $20,000 of VOO. Or SPY, about $10,000 into VO, $10,000 into VO. 
and or 10,000 into IWM. So these are ETFs. So in other words, it's helping you break down what would be generally accepted accounting principles and how much we should be investing at any given time in our portfolios. So we can use all that. That's some really great information. I like all that. It's not everything I really want to know, but it's telling me that I might want to have, if I kind of go through this, about $20,000 into VOO. So I can then go back to um, where we're just at to our website. And let's just type in the ticker symbol VOO and pull up a chart and see what we have. Because it's telling me I want to put about $20,000 into this. And what I see is this is actually on our charts here was in a nice uptrend for the last one, two, three, four, five, six. Don't worry if you understand my charts. I'm just showing you that for the last six months it was in an uptrend. And about the last two weeks, it's been slowly dropping, dropping, dropping. And now it's actually starting to roll over. So which one of these do I want? Let's go here. So we can see that it was going higher, 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 higher. And then right now we're starting to now drop. But it's telling me I should put some money into this right now. I don't necessarily know if I want to put money into it while it's going down. But it doesn't tell me that. So that's some of the limitations that it has. And so do I really want to use it? No. Well, Chat GPT asked me, I said, are you good at picking stocks? It said, we're good at analyzing data, but you still need to learn the principles yourself and use the combination of both. So it doesn't tell you when a good time to buy VO is. So if I just go back and ask it, what's a good time to buy VO? It won't tell me. It doesn't have it to it. So it can help you with automated portfolios, but when are you going to buy? How long are you going to hang on to them through? That's kind of trade management type of stuff. And Currently, it's not real good at the trade management because that's the part that can be sued. When you're using a chat bot and it makes mistakes and you lose your money, that court case that went through with uh, the airlines where it said, hey, in the, in the U.S. airlines here, uh, you're going to get a refund if you go ahead and do this. It's still okay to do that without <coughs> getting the refund first. You can still use the plane ticket. When the U.S. court system came out and said, nope, that's wrong, and the chat box didn't matter what it said, the person behind the chat box, the company behind it, is what's liable for that. The trade manager is one that tells you when to buy, how long to buy, when to put in a stop loss, how when to get out of that stop loss. Conditional orders like if this stock drops to this amount with support level here for the next two days, actually closes higher for the next two days, go back and buy the stock at a limit of this price, you know, above, up and above this. And once filled, place the conditional order to sell. That's all trade management. Now, there's some stuff you can actually do with your brokerage firms that will do that for you. Automated trading like that. It's a little bit scary when you get to it at this point. Do I really want to use all of it? There's some forms you can use that. Uh, what's currently being used a lot right now for a lot of the uh, whoops, what's currently being used right now for a lot of the AI uh, is uh, called the efficient frontier. Some of you may have heard that, maybe you haven't heard that. I don't know. Um, clear all drawings and go back to my pointer. It's called the efficient frontier, and this is uh, a Nobel Prize winning formula that's been used for a few years now. And it just kind of tells you if you're taking a look at something. Let's see if I can get that to come up. There we go. Uh, and this is something we're using on our website currently. And let's see what screen do you guys see? Okay, good. And so got some stocks typed in here, IBM, Tesla, Meta, V. So you just type in four, five, six, eight, 10, 12, two, whatever stocks you want. Start date, today's date, and say optimize my portfolio. And what it will actually do, it'll go back and say, based off of the data, the historical data for this information, uh, what do we expect it to do going forward in the future? It's uh, a, uh, a volatility risk measure with uh, expected gains. This tells you that you can expect annualized returns from these of about 28% in a balanced portfolio with annual volatility of 27% and a sharp ratio of 97. I want this number to be as high as possible. It's just another risk reward. I'm not going to get too much into this. I'm just saying how is it currently being used? And this is an AI model type of portfolio that's been used for uh, about five or six years now that a lot of people have been using. It's not perfected yet. We have it on our website. We haven't perfected it yet either. But it just tells you based off of some of the things you're after. So if I went back and maybe changed some of these ticker symbols to something else. But if I scroll down, this just tells me optimized portfolio. This would be my, if I started with $100, I'd have over $1,200 for my $100 investment at this point of time uh, based off of that. And realistically, what you want to see is I want to see very little volatility, which means risk. Uh, against my expected return over here on the right-hand side. And so it just kind of gives you a balanced model of how many shares of each of those four things that you would have. And over time, it tells you to go back and sell some of these shares and buy some more of these other shares over through here. And it's balanced, and it does it all by itself. 
And so this is called the Efficient Frontier. Uh, and it's where a lot of people are going currently today with uh, portfolio optimization that a lot of companies are working with. It's not perfect. It's got its drawbacks like everything else. But it does help to know that at any given time, if you went through and picked some good stocks off of your screens and said, what are some good portfolios with those stocks? What are some of the stocks I should have? How many of each of those shares should I have in the Efficient Frontier over through here? Uh, you can even ask for data interpretation. So if I went back now to chat GPT and said, uh, here's a stock I'm looking at. Uh, what is the expected price move on LW? It's a stock that I'm watching right now. And so let me just go back first and we'll pull up a chart of LW. So this is a stock that had a really nice move up, started going sideways for a while, and then came out with some earnings that weren't as good as anticipated on and dropped a little bit. And then they stopped, stopped dropping and started to bottom out. And so they started to go down, 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 now sideways for about the last two weeks. It was one of the very few stocks, up to $2.11, that was actually up today when the whole market was down. So one of the few stocks that's actually said, okay, we've dropped, we had some earnings come out, maybe it wasn't as bad as everybody thought, and now we're starting to have an overreaction, and now we're starting to bounce back up to the upside. So here's a stock that I have in my watch list that I'm looking at, <coughs> wanting to know what am I going to buy, and preferably I'm going to buy as soon as this thing moves above, which is right through here, this high point right here. So as it moves above that high, I'm going to buy the stock. But let's see what does ChatGPT tell me. What's the expected price move on LW? Currently, analysts have set a generally optimistic forecast for the stock, predicting significant price movements in the upcoming months. The consensus among analysts is that LW could experience an average price increase of about 48% over the next year. I like 48%. Potentially reaching an average price of 117.40, which is the estimates on the high end suggest 130. So in other words, out of all the analysts following the stock, they think it should be trading at least 117 sometime this year. Wow. And even the lowest price they think it'll be sometime this year is around $98 a share. This positive outlook is supported by several analysts across major financial institutions, reinforcing strong buy consensus based on current evaluations. Oh, huh. that might be something I'm after. So what's a data prediction? You know, it's predicting what do I think is going to go back in the future. These are some of the things that AI is currently being used for today. And the first two here are very easy. Just say, hey, what's a good company that you run some stock screens off? Give me from those screens, tell me what stocks are probably best for that. And then say, what stocks are best for that from your automated portfolios? And then say, what's the expected move on those stocks? And so those are some things you can go back and do currently uh, in the stock market, which is some of the different chat box tools that are out there. Uh, I like them. Uh, so here's how we use them on our website currently today. And so I'm going to go over back to our website here. Uh, it's just incompare.com. I'm on the website and I'm going to go over here where it says asset allocation. And I'm just going to click on it, asset allocation. Now from here, we're going to kind of do the same things that it was just asking us to go back and do as we kind of look back through here. Stock picking. So let's do some screen. So we're doing the same thing. It's asking, what age are you? So remember when I said, how, how much should a hundred thousand dollar portfolio invest for 55 years is because based on how old you are, it's telling you how much money should be in stocks versus bonds versus international funds, REITs, things like that. So I'm 55. When do you want to retire? It's asking you, when do you want to retire? Uh, about the age of 65 would be good. Now, do you want aggressive or conservative portfolio? Generally, you're going to choose aggressive if you're under 60. And when you hit 60, you start to go a little more conservative. What's the current value of your portfolio? And so we can say that it's $100,000 if we want. Uh, and do you want to add a, any additional funds to your portfolio on a monthly basis? Just like if you're doing a 401k or something. And then click calculate the breakdown. Now, based off of our artificial narrow intelligence uh, and the information it gave us, using all of the historical data that was available for these, for these, it says that your equity ETFs, we should have about $39,000 invested into equity ETFs, which are just mutual funds that trade like stocks, but they have just stocks in them. So these are just big funds that own stocks. You know, S&P 500 type stocks. And we should have about $16,000 invested into international equity ETFs. So these would be funds that own international stocks, which kind of diversify us a little bit. And we should have about $17,000 into some type of bond funds, $18,000 into income funds. So we're using artificial intelligence, narrow artificial intelligence, to tell us where the money should be placed at based off of today's market, how old you are today, and the money you're working with today. And this changes. And it just tells you then if we go 
back over this over time, uh, this portfolio based off if, if we do these breakdowns based on where we're at here using this efficient frontier portfolio optimization, it just tells us that by the time we are 60, our portfolio should be worth about $140,000 by the time we're 60. Huh, okay. That sounds okay. Now, if we notice that, it's just going to say that here's how much your portfolio is going to be up or down any given year based off of how much money changes. Because as time changes, as we get closer to 61, 62, 63, we're putting less money in stocks and more towards the bond market. So it's actually adjusting those numbers for us, telling me that by the time I'm all done, uh, I should have about $178,000 when I retire. So you ask yourself, starting with hundred grand, will that be enough to retire off of? And if the answer is no, we just go back up to the top and you can't change how old you are. I don't think you can. You can say, I want to retire at 67. But maybe you say, I'm now going to add an extra $250 a month in my portfolio so I can use that money and the compounding interest that goes off that year by year and now see where I'm going to be. And that tells me I should now have around $221,000 to retire off of. So you kind of play around and see where you're at. If you want to know, like, hey, if I should have about $39,000 invested in equity ETFs, click right here to see a list of all the equity ETFs that are available to you. Now, here's something that I want to show you. First, let's go down to the very bottom. You should have about $221,000 in here. This is if you do this yourself. If you're currently having someone do this for you, what I just did here this last five minutes, if you're currently having someone do this for you right now, and let's say they only charge you a 1% management fee, which is crazy because they don't. It's actually around a little over 3% uh, because of all the hidden fees you just don't know about. Uh, if they take away that 1%, your 221000 is now $195,000. In other words, someone's going to charge you around $26,000, which is one quarter of your current portfolio, $100,000, to do this for you, 26%. And all they're doing is this. They're going to go back up and say, hey, based off of the information that you provided here, information you provided, when we went through all this, uh, it said you should have about $39,000 invested into equity ETFs. So if I click here, a list of all equity ETFs, they all come up. So I should have about $39,000 invested. And here's the kicker part right here. I want you guys to follow this. These are the biggest ETFs in the entire stock market. Uh, this is a bearish one. So don't look at this one here because I don't want to cover that. But if we just go down to the right-hand side over here, this is a three-month chart. And so if I Look at this. This is three months, and I really want you to see which way it's currently going uh, as of right now if we take a look at this. This one is going down. This one is going down. This one had a big spike up today because it's a bearish one, so don't even look at it. It's bearish. It's, it's opposite. This one's going down. This one's going down. This one's going down. And if I just scroll down off this list here, they'll find out that every single one of these that we look at is in a downtrend. These are all the big ETFs. This is a bearish one. Bearish ones, it means it goes the opposite direction. So if the markets are down, it goes up. But if the market goes up, these drop dramatically. So just look at them. Down, 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 down. In other words, you're supposed to put about $39,000 into one of these ETFs. So this one here would be uh, an ETF that tracks the S&P 500. So this one, one fund right here has 500 companies in it. Do you really want to go back and say, hey, I want to own this as it's dropping? I think I'd like to buy it today because ChatGPT just said buy. This is where it says when you look at ChatGPT, are you good at analyzing portfolios? We're good at analyzing data, but you should still learn on your own and combine the use of both sides together with your knowledge first off of the analysis from ChatGPT or some type of a, a chat bot for finances. And so do I really want to use that? No. What that tells me is, if I go back and look at the next 25, down, down. Again, this is a bearish one, so I don't want to take a look at that. Down, down, down. Bearish one. I don't want to take a look at that. Every one that's a one that actually owns stocks is in a downtrend. So here's what that means. Don't work with these. These are bearish ones. Again, don't look at those. Downtrend, downtrend, downtrend. What that tells me is I don't want to buy. So even though when I went back and said to – as I was going back and taking a look at all these uh, – I should have about $39,000 into equity ETFs. All of the equity ETFs right now are in a downtrend because the markets are pulling back. Why are the markets pulling back? Because the Fed is not lowering interest rates. Why isn't the Fed lowering interest rates? Because retail sales were high again today. And the CPI numbers were high again last week. So the Fed says we're not lowering interest rates right now, which means people are selling the stock. So here's the difference. 
If you currently have someone doing this for you right now, I'm going to guarantee if you went back and looked at your portfolio last Friday or two Fridays ago and look at it today, it's down. Why is it down? Because the person managing your funds doesn't care about you. For me, if it's telling me, hey, Mike, right now you should have $39,000 invested in the equity ETFs. I don't want to invest in any equity ETFs. They're on the downtrend. I'm going to wait. I'm not going to buy them as they're dropping. I'm going to wait until they stop dropping and start to stop dropping and say, now we're going to start to bounce. And when they start to bounce, that's when I want to go back and buy. But that doesn't come from any of your chat bots. That's why we have to learn this ourselves. So as an example, uh, if I clicked on my equity ETFs right in through here, and say, you know, I would like to go back and I'm just going to pull up this one here. Let's just pull up. Here's a China large cap FXI. Let's pull up this one right here. So if I said, you know, I want to go ahead and buy. I don't want this one here. Whenever it stops dropping is when I want to go back and buy it. So let's say we're going to pull up XLE, the energy sector for the financial market. The whole of these are a bunch of energy stocks. So right now they're in an uptrend, 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 uptrend. They're looking good. They're trending higher, higher, higher. And it's just starting to pull back right now. So let's say that pulls back somewhere around $90 a share. And at $90 a share, it just stops dropping, goes sideways for a little bit, and then starts to bounce. That's when I want to put my money to use. I don't want to buy something just because I was told to buy it today, even though I know what a balanced portfolio is because I was able to pull up a balanced portfolio by asking just a couple of questions on here. And it gave me my balanced portfolio. So just because it's there telling me to buy, doesn't mean I have to buy today. Use your knowledge. Use your own intelligence. Use the information that you're taught because this is your money. This is why there are no chat box being used even by or financial chat box being used even by the largest investment bank in America that's been using AI for over 10 years with over 2,000 dedicated employees training its system how to work. Still not used just yet. So how do we use that? The data is out there. There's data we can use for to learn about how do I analyze a stock. Uh, we can use predictive models on our website. So, like for instance, if I was using, let's go back now to uh, LW that we we're taking a look at. Predictive models on here as well on LW. What it tells me right through here across the very top is every single time that LW bounces up off of a floor, every time LW bounces up off of a floor, which means you hit a floor, it moves around four dollars per share. Four dollars per share. And it takes around eight trading days to move $4 a share. Hmm. Okay, that's average. So if it's starting to bounce up off the floor right now, it should move around $4 to the upside uh, in eight trading days. So we've got predictive models on here. some cool stuff that's out here. Uh, <clears throat> but the point is simply this. Do you want to have AI do all of your investing for you currently? And the answer is probably no. Are there some really cool things it can do as a, uh, trying to find some good stocks for me. Yeah. Is it correct? It told me the most undervalued stock in the stock market today was Qualcomm. It's trading way over the Warren Buffett discounted uh, undervalued method. It didn't even it didn't even mention Delta, which is in a nice trend right now currently and is undervalued. So it's still a ways away. It's just not there yet. Does it mean it's not coming? It's coming. And there are some things you can do with it. Uh, it's just that for the most part, you're still going to want to learn to do this yourself. Uh, and follow just some of the things that AI gives you because all it is is the same thing as having somebody who's really good at the stock market that you can call on the telephone and say, hey, give me some information and tell me about this. Does that mean that you're going to do what they tell you to do? No, it's your money. They're not liable for anything that they tell you uh, in your portfolio with your spouse and your family, correct? And so what is it going to tell you? It's going to tell you just enough that it doesn't really get you into too much trouble. So how do we do that ourselves? If we really want to make money, we've got to learn about this in much more detail on our own. So uh, we do asset allocation on our own, on our own website. We try to buy in lots of 100 and then add those to a watch list. And let's say we do. Let's say we go back now and we add a stock like that to our watch list. Uh, we just come back here to watch list once we buy a stock. Where am I at here? What screen are you guys looking at? Um Add the ticker some of your watch list. Go back and put in here. Here's LW in my watch list. Here's A, B, P, T, E, N. A couple stocks to watch this. All you do is just type it in here. So whatever it might be, A, uh, B, A, B, A, whatever it might be. Here's Alibaba. Uh, type it in. And then once you add that stock to your watch list, and you put enter in here. Now you come over here and slide these little sliders right here where it says on. Where it says on. 
And now anytime that your stock actually starts to drop that you own, this may be in your asset allocation, maybe you're managing your own portfolio and you only do it once a year or so, whatever it might be. Uh, anytime that those stocks that you own, those ETFs start to drop and they go through the floor and now they're starting to move into a downtrend, you get an automatic email alert and a text alert saying, hey, your stock is starting to drop. You might want to just go back and sell it. Because unlike your portfolio manager who's not selling the things you own right now and your portfolio is down from where it was two, two weeks ago, you will say, I don't want to be down for the next two weeks. I'm just going to sell. And I'm going to wait now until I start seeing some nice stocks or ETFs come back into an uptrend before I go back and buy. And so that's what's really kind of cool about that. So you want to go back and learn that yourself and use the tools, the, the AI we have for you. Say, hey, your stock is starting to move into a downtrend, predictive analysis on where it's probably heading and you don't want it anymore. So you just go back and you sell. Money stays in your account uh, and then you just wait to reuse it until you see something comes back and starts moving back into an uptrend for you. It's really cool stuff. Uh, I like it. If you'd like to learn more about AI and about more about how to find good ETFs or stocks to put in your portfolio, how long to hang on to those stocks for, how to do a better job at reading the charts of when to get in, when to sell, how to put in a trailing stop loss order, or even how to write a covered call, something we teach. We've got a live class coming up. It's a two-day class. I don't have just an hour like I had tonight. It's a two-day class on May 4th and the 5th, Saturday and Sunday from 11 a.m. till 6 p.m. And I'll spend two days on how do we analyze a really good stock? So if we find a stock through AI or we do a search for a stock, how do we know it really is a good stock versus what AI tells us versus what's in our database? How is it that you, you learn to know to say that's correct or incorrect? Because again, you do not want to have somebody else's machine learning product telling you how to manage your entire portfolio when you don't know who they are, you don't know what mistakes they've made or what biases they might have. You can use that data that they have. And that's what AI is really good for is letting it do the research, but we still need to know how to uh, invest. What percentage are we going to invest? How long are we going to hang on to it? When do we actually sell? Now, you're not doing this every day. You're doing this maybe once a week, once a month type of thing for a few minutes and then let the machines do the rest for you. So you have a two-day class coming up May 4th and 5th, Saturday and Sunday. You can go to protectwealth.com forward slash stocks. So right now you're watching our, our webinar here with uh, Protect Wealth and forward slash stocks for uh, investing to register for the class. Uh, it comes with a guest. If you're bringing a guest with you, they get free access to the class as well because we find out people learn better in pairs versus by themselves. Uh, so password for two. And it's uh, free in a way. Uh, what I mean by that is if you go to the class at the end of the very first day of the class, you say, I don't like the class, Mike, it's just not for me. I'll refund your money for it. It's only $197. It's not like it's going to break the bank. But go to the class, learn what we have to see, see who we are, see how we teach, what kind of uh, products we have, how our website works and some of the cool tools. We have some very, very cool tools on the website. Uh, come to the entire first day of the class. At the end of the first day of the class, you say, I don't like it. Send me an email. I'll refund your $197. Uh, and that's all it is. So I do have limited availability. And the reason for that isn't because I can't put 100 people, 200 people on a webinar. It's because I assign you a coach for that two-day class. So you can specifically ask questions that pertain to just you. I don't want everybody else knowing everything that's about your business. So I don't have enough coaches for everybody. So it's limited availability. So the next class I have coming up is May 4th and 5th. Go ahead and register for that. Uh, go to the, the link on here, protectwealth.com forward slash stocks. Register for our class, and uh, I'll be happy to go into two full days of detail. How do we analyze? If something says it's a good stock or it's undervalued, how do we analyze that? When do we buy? When do we sell? How long do I hang on to it for? What specifically should I be looking at? What if the website tells me, hey, your stock is moving into a predictive downtrend? How do I sell? What are the consequences for selling? What kind of an account can I put this in? A personal account? A corporate account? Uh, an LLC? Uh, what am I able to do, some type of an IRA? So we'll go through all of that over the next two days. So go ahead and register for this, protectwealth.com forward slash stocks. I will be the instructor for the class, and I'll spend two days answering all of your questions. You didn't have too many today. Uh, someone's, I've taken Mike's two-day class. I really liked it, and I learned a lot. Well, thank you. Um, but uh, I would go ahead and get registered for this because you can't go wrong. Uh, and I'll give you a couple of free bonuses once you register for it as well to prepare you for the class coming up. Uh, but go ahead and register now. And uh, we'll get started with the information. I'll give you immediate access to the website. You'll be able to log in. I'll give you a couple of bonuses, things to check out on the website, to use it, to get comfortable before your class comes up. So, Kendall, I'm going to turn it back over to you. That's all I had for this. Uh, and hopefully it was a little bit informative. Uh, some of the cool things AI can do, what it can't do. 
uh, and how we use AI currently today with our own education and put the two together to really maximize it. We're at the very, very beginning stages. Uh, and you want to learn about how to go back and use that because it's going to be everywhere and everything we do. So the more familiarity you have with it going forward, the easier everything else is going to be that you see AI coming out with. So I'm going to turn it back over to you, Kendall. Thank you for the time here. You're so great, Mike. I I'm grateful you're on it because you're right. We're at the tip of this. And I, I appreciate you being on it because I can lean on you a little bit <laughs> to, <Yeah. laughs> to understand it. Uh, absolutely phenomenal. And just totally interesting to me. I, I really loved your analysis because, you know, it's that old adage, trust but verify, right? And you did yes. that. You, you asked it questions. And, hey, if I didn't know any better, oh, artificial intelligence is way smarter than me. I'm going to take the artificial intelligence recommendations and just invest those. Well, you proved don't just do that. That's that's kind of scary to do that kind of stuff. It is. And what if somebody told you that, hey, you're a pension fund right now is being is being traded by an AI trading bot. That's your pension fund. I don't know who, who wrote that program. What kind of biases do they have? You know, what if it loses money and the program starts saying, oh, we're losing money. So let's double down, which means buy more lower price. And you keep buying more of something that keeps on drop until it goes bankrupt. I don't know. And I don't want that to happen. I want to I want the capabilities of AI, but just like you said, trust needs to be verified. I need to go back and learn it myself so I can see, oh, that was actually really good. I really appreciate what AI just told me to do because I can see why now that I go back and do that. And when we become an informed investor, we make much, much better decisions. It's fascinating, Mike. I, I, I do believe there'll be the economy will absolutely change because of AI, but uh, you're on top of it. Thank you so much for sharing this. I, I learned a ton, actually, so I very, very much appreciate it. Uh, and, and guys, uh, Mike, you can't make it any easier. $197. I've lost uh, way more than that, just guessing stocks in the past, you know, and yeah. so you just... You can't find a better deal out there for the top quality education you get with Mike and his team. You really can't. That's a very, very low price to get in and learn from the best. And it's on Zoom, right? It's, it's easy. You can go do it for your couch. It's beautiful. Yeah. And, and, and during the class, I will actually be buying and selling uh, real stocks, real, real trades in the class. So you can see how a real professional does it in the class. I'll donate that money to a charity, uh, but I actually place trades live with my own personal portfolio in every single class. Uh, and then use that money donate to different charities. So you'll see how it actually works in real time, not just finding good stock or saying, here's a good way to enter into it, but I'll actually put my money where my mouth is type of thing. And so that's where you see that we're really out there doing good with that because there's no way I would actually open up my own personal portfolio and place trades live in front of everybody if I wasn't actually making money using the system here. So that's what's really kind of cool about it. And then I'll use oh, those profits. I'll donate them to charities that are students on those classes say here's the best ones for us i looked at your website mike and and yeah you're, you're actually saying you have 31 years of experience that's unreal because you do you do live trades and you wouldn't be around that long or doing live trades or classes if you weren't the real deal so i love it mike thank you so much for being so transparent and teaching us we appreciate it thanks kendall yeah and by the way everybody i did put that link in the chat screen so if you go to your chat screen there it'll actually have a link that is clickable and you said may 4th and 5th correct mike yeah, May 4th and 5th. And if you can't make that one, you can still register for it and get access to the website and still play around and use it for everything that's got on there. And I'll send you a little video about how to use because there's a lot of really cool proprietary tools on the website. I'll send you a video on how to use that. But you can go ahead and register now, get access to the website immediately, and then uh, just schedule for the next class. The next one will be sometime in uh, probably early June, mid-June. But I usually do at least one class every month. So if you can't make this one, you can still register and just come to a future class in the future as well. And then yeah, you can so use you everything uh, until you take that very first day of class before yeah. you tell me if you want a refund on it. So I'm not yeah, here to, make, to, to take your $197. I'm here to keep you as a yeah. lifelong customer. That's what I'm after. Yeah. And guys, we, we know that we have 20 plus years with Mike uh, here at Protect Wealth Academy, myself and Don. And so we uh, we go back a long ways with Mike. Uh, we traveled literally on a cruise ships to Alaska and different places. So I've been ar around the world almost with Mike. Uh, and and truthfully, guys, we know a lot of students who have been with Mike. And it's I know, Mike, it's hard to pull everybody and say, hey, what's your return or whatever? You know, past performance is not predict future results. But we, I can tell you of the students we've talked to over the years, 
They've done extremely well, uh, absolutely mind-blowingly well, Mike, actually. <laughs> Some of the people I talk to, it's actually phenomenal to me. So uh, kind of exciting. Um, Mike, did you want to answer a few questions before we end? Uh, yeah, so I'm looking at this right here. Uh, it says, in company investing in AI, can you see the fundamentals? Uh, if they're deploying, impl implementing uh, AI effectively, for example, JP Morgan Chase has probably invested a significant amount of capital in AI over that, you can actually go through just chat GPT or Copilot or uh, Gemini and just and ask, or you can probably even just do a Google search, how much money has uh, has uh, JP Morgan Chase invested in AI so far? Because you know, like I showed you one of the screens on there that uh, NVIDIA has already invested, you know, 94 or 90 or $33 billion this year type of stuff uh, in that. So yeah, you can go and see some of those. Uh, if and if they're doing it right, you know, return on investment type of stuff. So ask out there. Sometimes you'll get the information off of uh, off of chat GPT for a question like that. That's going to be a little bit more up to date. Uh, I would use Copilot. And the reason for that is Copilot, uh, which is Microsoft product, and it uses chat GPT as a backbone, but it's hooked up to the Internet. So it'll give, it'll give you information that might be more current than chat GPT, which pulls more on uh, data that's in the database. Does that make sense? So. Uh, you can ask it, and I'm sure we'll give you that information. Uh, Candace asks, if I talk this fast in class, I do talk fast. I, I, I know I do, Candace, and I apologize for that. Part of it is I'm trying to put this into an hour-long program here. We went way past that. Uh, the other part is when I do a live class, a two-day class, I do start to slow down a little bit more because I get a little bit more tired you know, on a two-day class, and I actually have – uh, on my notes, I got a big piece of paper that says slow down. And so I will slow down and I will speed up, but I'm usually a little bit slower on a two-day class. Uh, than and I don't give my caffeine days. on those days. You can't have any caffeine at all. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, yeah, I can't have any caffeine. I can towards the very end of the first day and very end of the second day, just because I want to make sure I'm still coherent and saying that the right things are coming out of my mouth. You know, <laughs> I love it. Yeah, I, I talk fast too, Mike. My my mind goes fast and my mouth can keep up. And that, that happens to me a lot. So I get yeah. that. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, no, thank you so much, Mike. I, I really do appreciate it. it honestly, uh, I think this is the wave of the future. Uh, and there's no better way to learn than, than from Mike and his class and his team. They're, they're on top of it. I Seriously, Mike, I do appreciate you being on top of it. It's actually fascinating. Thank you. And it's just, it's some really cool stuff you can do with it. It's just right now, it's more in the data research places where AI is for investing right now. Uh, and it's just not into the automatic trades, you know, where people want it to go. And the reason for that is just, just because there's so many variables. It's like, you know, do I buy this stock? Okay, buy the stock when it moves up this much off a of support level, but only on days where the market is, you know, up a certain amount and not down this, but also if these technical indicators are this, but not if the Fed's about to meet tomorrow, but do so if it's attached to the oil sector and the price of oil has, as an industry has risen, uh, only if it's a WTI, West Texas Intermediate Crude, but not European crew, you know, so there's so many variables you have to continue to correct every time it gives you, here's the result, you have to go back and change it and say, yes, this was correct, but less of this. And there's just so many things that you can put as a variable into the stock market as, uh, oh, you know, Jerome Powell just spoke today unannounced. Oh, somebody just ran this fake editorial in the Wall Street Journal. You know, there's so many variables out there that the investing companies and these chat bots don't want to be sued like they can now because there's precedent of what just happened uh, with uh, uh, the airlines. And so the precedent is, yeah, you can go back and sue the company and not the chat box, but the company. And so nobody really wants to say, yep, here's when you buy, here's when you sell and stick to it. And that's why you want to learn that so that you can know when you do stick to it, when you do buy and when you sell. Let the, let the, let the AI give you the research on why this is good, why you should probably buy it, but you need to make that last decision yourself. It's the only, only, only available option at this point in time. Yeah, the experts aren't, aren't running scared yet. Uh, you know, they had that recent attorney who submitted a brief and yeah. they cited case law and the case law was absolutely fake, completely made up because the attorney was too lazy to actually research the case law and cited it directly from chat GPT and it yeah. wasn't real. That's absolutely scary to me. You can't yeah. rely on it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It is. It is. And so, and, and, that, yeah. and that company got sued for it. You know, the attorney company. Yeah. Lost the case and actually got sued for that. Yeah. All righty. <laughs> Mike, again, thank you so much for time. I appreciate it. Everyone, if if you want to, uh, we suggest you definitely go and sign up for Mike's class, May 4th and 5th. It's one of the best classes I've ever done. We love it. We appreciate Mike and his team. Mike, thanks again so much for being on tonight. Absolutely fascinating. All right. Thanks, Kendall. Hey, Don. Bye.
Thanks, Mike. All right. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody. Have a great night.